You are listening to the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast, a show devoted to uncovering the systems and the secrets that set the best apart, where you learn how to take your coaching clients to the next level while you grow the coaching practice of your dreams. So sit back and relax, or sit up and get excited. Either way, you might want to pay attention. This could be important. Hey, thanks for joining me on the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. I'm so glad you're here because otherwise I'm just all by myself. I am speaking to you actually from my living room in uh, the Hudson Valley of New York State, where my wife and I have been uh, encamped for the past several months since the outbreak of this COVID-19 thing. And um, I am literally by myself in this living room talking to you while talking to the microphone where I'm imagining you are listening. So I, I hope this comes across okay. It's kind of weird, isn't it? This kind of it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Perhaps people in radio are always facing this kind of weird thing. They're talking into a microphone where no one is actually there with them. But um, it's unusual for me. So uh, thanks for being here, putting up with us. Hopefully it'll be kind of kind of interesting to you. This Essential Coaching Skills podcast is about, obviously, I suppose, from the name, what skills might be essential to a coach. Now, I assume that you listening to this are a coach, or at least are interested in being a coach. And I don't know if you'll necessarily agree with me entirely. And I do believe that there are some points here that will be uh, universally accepted as being important. As an example, the ability to persuade is vitally important, I would say, to anybody who's doing coaching in any way, shape, or form. If you're a little league football coach or baseball coach or soccer coach, you need to be able to persuade your charges, your kids, that they need to run around the field four times or you know play defense the way you're supposed to or whatever it might be. You need to be able to be persuasive. Whether you're an executive coach, whether you're a life coach, whether whatever kind of coaching you are, persuasion is important. Sleight of mouth, which is one of my fields of expertise, you might say, is about that. Sleight of mouth comes from the field of neuro linguistic programming, or NLP, as I'm sure you probably are aware. NLP is uh, a field that looks at the brain as if it's like a computer, hence the name. The whole idea of NLP, which I, forgive me if you know this already, but I'm assuming that some of you do not. So I'm just going to make sure that I cover all the bases. NLP is a field that is about looking at the brain. If it's, it's like a computer. So therefore, the neuro is your brain, the neurology of your brain. Linguistics is the language of that brain. So how does it communicate with itself? How does it send signals and messages to itself. And the programming is then, therefore, how do you get it to do what you want it to do? Like a computer, you've got to put input in, you've got to put data into the system, then it runs a program of some kind, and then you get a result out, right? That's how computers work. Your brain works in a similar fashion. It gets data in, it runs some kind of program, and then it gets a result out. Pretty simple when you stop and think about it. And very, very useful when you really do stop and appreciate what that's telling us, which is that unlike psychology, which is to say uh, looking back and finding the source of all the problems and maybe getting insight as to how it works, so therefore we can change our behaviors, NLP says, yeah, okay, that could be useful and What's probably more useful is to say what data is being processed, how to give us this particular result. Maybe we can change the data. Maybe we can change the process by which it's being processed and one way or the other get a different result. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you've got to go back into your past and suss out all these places where the problems uh, originated. That's what NLP is all about. In the process of trying to ascertain certain 
ways that our brains function, neurolinguistic programming, or at least the guys that started neurolinguistic programming, Richard Bandler and John Grinder primarily at the outset, to creators of it, of the field, modeled a lot of great people. They modeled, they looked at people like Milton Erickson and Virginia Satir, Ericksonian hypnotherapy, most famously, um, Milton Erickson was a psychiatrist, and he also did hypnosis. Virginia Satir was a family therapist. They modeled them. They said, how do they do what they do? How, they, how do they get such great results? They modeled these people, and much of what we know of as NLP is, is a result of their modeling of this patterns, these patterns, these processes that those people did in getting changed clients, how, the, how their customers, how their clients, how their patients, you know, became healthier because of the processes they, they did with them. Other people like uh, Fritz Perls and Frank Farrelly were also modeled by Bandler and Grinder. Somewhere along the line, one of the guys who was a student of Bandler was noticing also that Bandler had a particular way of being very persuasive as well. Bandler, he's, he noticed, was extremely adept at persuading people of a, of a belief system, true or not. In some instances when they're training people in NLP, Bandler would take on a kind of absurdly formed belief, like somebody's out to get me, and I know that's true because uh, they put the coffee cup on the left side of my table when I always have it on the right side of my table. So <laughs> he would come up with this absurd belief. But then he'd challenge people to try to change him, you know, based on their hopefully newly acquired skills of doing NLP, you know, persuade me otherwise. Nobody ever could. He was always had the ability to turn things around. So this student of Robert of, of Richard Bandler's, his name is Robert Diltz, started modeling Bandler. He took what Bandler and Grinder were doing to everybody else and said, let's apply this to them. How are they doing this? How is he, specifically Richard Bandler, how is he specifically doing this persuasion stuff that's so uncanny, so amazing? How does he do that? So he applied NLP to the NLPers. You might say he applied NLP to NLP. You might say that. I wouldn't say that. I, I don't know why you would say that. Um, but you might. People have. I, I've said that. Um, but in, in real, actual fact, he was, he was applying NLP to the guy that created NLP, Richard Bander, and saying, how does he do what he does? And in codifying those skills that Bander had, he came up with different patterns of persuasion. He started giving them names and tracing them and saying, okay, this pattern is called the consequence pattern, or that pattern is called the intention pattern, or that pattern is called the chunking down pattern, or that pattern is called the model of the world pattern. And he noticed these repetitive things that would come up from time to time, that Bandler would do these language patterns, these persuasion patterns, and he said, oh, there he goes again, he's doing another one of those consequence things. Or there he goes again, he's doing another one of those influence patterns, I mean, I'm sorry, intention patterns. Right? He'd notice these things. When he began to codify them and name them, he could track them more readily. And finally, what Richard, uh, what, I'm sorry, Robert Diltz did with Richard's stuff is he created a kind of icon representational chart where he said, okay, we're going to put whatever belief Richard is working on in the center of this chart and like a mind map, go around in a circle, put these icons around this thing spaced in these different places where I'm going to be able to codify these different patterns and thus make them functional. And thus, sleight of mouth was born. That is the beginning of sleight of mouth. These modeling of these persuasion patterns that Richard Bandler just sort of extemporaneously did. But Robert Diltz noticed the patterns and named them, codified and put them in this way so that mere mortals like you and I can emulate that. We can replicate that. We can model that. We can do our best to be like that. It's remarkably useful. <laughs> It's one of the most, I think, useful skills you can possibly have as a coach. And again, 
whether you're a little league football coach or whether you're an executive coach with, you know, big time CEOs as your clients, you definitely want to know how to do this skill. This persuasion skill is so elegant, so effective, people don't even know you're doing it. Half the time, it's so purely conversational. You know, it just seems like a conversation, not like somebody's doing kind of some kind of technique. Nobody's getting salesy on me, right? It's not like some sleazy, you know, used car salesman is trying to do his patterns on me. Oh, look out. No, it's just, it's like a conversation. That's how it's done when it's most elegant, at least. So there's 14 different patterns of persuasion that we get from sleight of mouth. 14 different patterns that uh, Robert Diltz codified from Richard Bandler's behavior that we can emulate. And that's what sleight of mouth is all about. Now, it's really useful to know those 14 patterns. It's usually very useful to be able to, you know, construct them and to be facile with how you'll say those things back to another person. But interestingly, at least I think it's interesting, to be really good at this stuff, it's not so much, to me, it's not so much about learning to say the right thing as it is to be able to listen very thoroughly and very deeply to what the person is really saying, to what your client is really saying. What beliefs do they really have? How do you listen so carefully that you really understand the structure of their belief thoroughly so that you can therefore most elegantly engage with that and lead them to someplace else? So let me see if I can explain that a little bit. By the way, when I teach sleight of mouth classes, I use a lot of illustrations. There's a lot of visual charts and things that we go through, flow charts, etc. So you can see how one thing leads to another in a very, you know, logical fashion. It might be a little more challenging to simply do it through describing the process, but I'm going to give it my best shot. One of the things about NLP is that it's, it says that there is a structure, a structure to the subjective experience of a human being. So you, I, Everybody has a brain that functions in a certain way, but our mind has a structure to it. So distinction between the brain and the mind. You know, the brain is the gray matter. It's the, you know, it's the amygdala and it's the frontal cortex and it's the hippocampus and the cingulate gyrus. You know, it's all these brain parts and brain functions that they do. Um, the occipital lobe, et cetera, et cetera. But the mind is kind of the result of all those behaviors coming together. Who you are is the brain functioning as a particular way, and that's, you know, different than just the brain being that organic matter. So your mind, the way you think, is more subjective. So as an example, I'm holding in my hand right now an object. You can't see it because this is radio or whatever, but nevertheless, trust me, I am, in fact, holding in my hands a particular object. It is round, it is spherical, um, it's a, a ball, and um, some people play tennis with it. I, I particularly use it for um, working on plantar fasciitis, <laughs> so it's, it's a therapeutic tool for me. But it, it is a tennis tennis ball. Right now, uh, we can agree on this thing. You can't see it, but you have to trust me. It is a, a green Wilson tennis ball. It has a number three on it, and it's fuzzy and you know like a, a tennis ball should be. Now, objectively, even if I'm describing it, you can probably make a pretty good picture in your mind and agree with me. Yes, this is a tennis ball. Objectively. So the object here in my hands is objectively a tennis ball. Now, subjectively, some people might look at this tennis ball. Believe it or not, a person could look at this tennis ball and just get totally freaked out. Right? They could look at this tennis ball and, and get freaked. It's a Wilson, just like I think Tom Hanks had a, 
a volleyball when he was marooned on the Castaway movie or whatever, and it was named Wilson. I believe it was named Wilson. So you might look at this ball and say, Wilson is like, oh my God, am I going to be stranded on and on? And this is what this is trying to say to me. It's an omen. Oh my God, I'm going to freak out. And so a person could, in fact, go through this whole subjective thing in their mind and be absolutely freaked out about the fact that I'm talking about a Wilson tennis ball here on this podcast. It could freak somebody out. I surely hope it does not. Um, but you you and I can both appreciate that people are, are, are unique and different and weird. And yeah, they could. Someone could do that. Their subjective experience could be unpleasant about this tennis ball in my hand. Um, somebody else might see this and go like, whoa, it's an old tennis ball. It's been uh, used quite a bit, hasn't it? And I remember a time when I had an old tennis ball like that. I used to play tennis back in high school, and I might start feeling very nostalgic about seeing an old tennis ball like this. All right, somebody else might say, hey, I'm a better tennis player than you, so I'm very, very, get very competitive about it, you know? Hey, come on, let's go. Let's go. Yeah, I'll show you. I'll show you what I can do. Let's go play and, and get very competitive about it. You know, people can have very, very different subjective experiences about any object that's out there. So NLP wants to say, well, how does that work? How does that possibly happen that this subjective thing can be so very, very different for different people? It's a simple little object here, this tennis ball. And this really is a tennis ball, by the way. I don't know if you can hear this. Can you hear that? Can you hear that? It's bouncing on the desk here. Um, how is it that a person can have such a very, very different thing? What does their brain do? What does their mind do? What is their thinking process that leads them from seeing this object to feeling this just terror or feeling this like nostalgia or feeling this competitiveness? You know, what leads to that end product? NLP will tell you that there is a structure to that. That, you know, for everybody who has this end result of feeling competitive or nostalgic or scared or whatever, there's a process that they go through, a syntax and a process that they go through that leads to that final feeling. So first they might see it, then they might talk to themselves, then they might make pictures in their mind of other times when they've seen those tennis balls, you know, et cetera, et cetera. They can go through this process. It's usually a step-by-step-by-step -step -step sequence. It doesn't change much for that particular individual. They'll go through the same process every time they see a tennis ball. They'll go through the same process and get to the same end result. So NLP wants to know what is that process. So if I want to say, if I have a client who comes in to my hypnosis therapy office, you know, and says, I am just freaked out by these tennis balls around. Every time I see a tennis ball, I'm totally like uh, overwhelmed with fear and, and angst. So I might think to myself, okay, well, gosh, that's really, really curious and interesting. How do you do that? What's the, the first thing you see? What's the second thing you say to yourself? What's the process by which you create that? If I can discern your syntax, discern your, discern your, your strategy for feeling freaked out, then I can perturb that strategy. I can change that strategy and make it so that you don't freak out anymore because something is different about that strategy and A leads to B, B leads to C, C leads to what? F? That's not right. That's not the way it works. Okay, never mind. Uh, you know, so you perturb the system and suddenly it doesn't work so well anymore. Conversely, I might also go to somebody who feels like really nostalgic and wonderful about tennis balls and say, okay, well, how do you do that? You know, what's that process about? And I could attempt to discern that strategy, that sequence of things that you first see or first hear or first say to yourself or whatever it might be. You know, ultimately, that strategy leads to this feeling of being nostalgic. I could say, once I know exactly it is how you do that, I can teach myself to do that too. Or I can teach my client to do that too. So instead of freaking out, they'll feel nostalgic and wonderful about tennis balls. They'll run the same program, right? The same neuro-linguistic program. They'll run the same program and get the same result. That's kind of what neuro-linguistics is all about. You can either use modeling a strategy to perturb a system that you don't want to use, 
where you can use a system to take on a system that you do want, a pattern that you do want, or a little bit of both, right? You can perturb the system that's not so useful and then add in the new system that is interesting and useful. So NLP is all about this structure. Now, NLP also will go further and tell you that, again, NLP won't tell you anything. NLP is a system. It's, a, it's not a person. So it's not going to say anything or do anything, but um, tell you anything. Within the field of NLP, however, you will find that there is a, a set idea about there is a structure to a belief. Every single belief that you may have in the world has a particular structure to it. Every belief has the same structure to it. Yeah, it's true. Every single belief has the same structure to it. It's, you know, they can be very, very different beliefs about very, very different things, but the structure is going to be the same. I find that fascinating, don't you? There's a structure to these things. So what's great about knowing that there's a structure to these things is then maybe there's a way you can interface with that structure and more elegantly shift those beliefs to something that's more useful, more productive. So as an example, um, every belief starts with an if-then. There's a a relationship between something happening, you know, something causing something else to happen. If, then. If this, then that. So if it rains out, then I take an umbrella. If it's sunny, then I take a jacket. If it's chilly, then I put on a sweater. You know, if this, then that. So these are all functional decisions along the way, but these are the structure of belief. Beliefs do this too. There is, however, a third section to a belief. A belief has three parts. There's an if, then. Then there is also a meaning attached. So a person might say, if it's raining, then I take my umbrella, and that means I'm, I'm taking care of myself. I'm happy. I'm, I'm uh, prepared. A person might say, if it's raining, then I take an umbrella, and that means... I'm gloomy because it's raining out. I don't want to take an umbrella all the time. It means I'm, you know, I'm being imposed upon. Or if it's raining, then I take an umbrella, and that means it's going to be a great day. I often let a smile be my umbrella, but whenever I have an umbrella, I feel like smiling. So it's a great day. So people can have a different meaning attached to the same cause effect, the same if then, but they can attach different meanings to it. That meaning part of this belief we call a complex equivalence in NLP terms. Um, so there's a cause effect and then there's a complex equivalence. But put all three together, it's called a normalized belief structure. And that NBS, the normalized belief structure, is true for everything. Now, the point is here, every single belief does have that structure, whether you want to believe me or not. It's true. It does. And the reason why it might not seem that way is because sometimes you might not get the whole belief when you're talking to someone. You might not even know it for yourself when you think about a belief that you have. You might just say, if it's raining, then I'll take an umbrella. Maybe you just unconsciously feel good or other than consciously feel prepared and, you know, whatever. You might not notice that meaning part, right, until someone asks you some good questions and sort of elicits that from you, brings it up from your other than conscious mind, brings it up to the surface so you know that it's there, right? you got to ask good questions in order to elicit the entire belief. People often will just say things like, well, this is good. Or that's bad. You know, things like that. There's no if, then, or means in the language that they're using. Right? So NLP, recognizing that language is our middle name, neuro-linguistic programming, NLP will want to say, well, hold on there. What's good? Or what's bad? 
what are you talking about here? You know, it, it's good, what's good? So when you ask a good question like that, you tend to get good answers. So a person who's talking to you might answer the question by saying, well, well, the weather's good or the weather's bad. You know, they'll tell you specifically the weather is good, the weather's bad, you know, so then they might begin to begin to elicit that if then about rain and etc. Right? Umbrellas, blah, blah, blah. So you get there by asking questions. There's a whole field. In fact, I will tell you, part of the reason for my creating this website called the Essential Coaching Skills website and the Essential Coaching Skills podcast that grew out of that is the idea of this section of NLP, this meta model. I'm I'm aghast. I'm really quite <laughs> intrigued by how anyone can be a coach and not know how to do the meta model. The meta model is so basic to NLP. It's how do you ask good questions in order to elicit from the person you're talking to what is their whole belief? What are they talking about? What's stopping them? What's their outcome? What do they want? You know, how will they know when they've gotten there? There are so many things in our language that are distorted or deleted or generalized in our language that we don't know half the time what a person's talking about. And we sometimes, at our peril, assume certain things and you know put into the structure things that we, we would have thought that they meant, but we don't know for sure unless we ask a good question. So this thing from the world of NLP called the meta model is about how do you retrieve those, you know, distorted and deleted and generalized language structures in order to know specifically exactly what the person is in fact saying. In sleight of mouth, we want to do that same thing to retrieve and know specifically what the belief is that a person has. Now, of course, when it comes to umbrellas and rain and stuff, that's not all that critical. Who cares whether a person takes an umbrella or not? Um, but when we're talking about coaching for a particular purpose that a purpose person comes to you for coaching for, maybe uh, making their life better in relationships, maybe making their life better as far as their business is concerned, but whatever it is, when we want to find out what beliefs are stopping them, what beliefs are useful for them, what ones that we want to enhance, the ones that we want to, you know, pull apart and dismantle, we need to find out by asking good questions. The meta model is part of what sleight of mouth does. And to be able to ask good questions and really discern exactly what it is that a person is saying is perhaps, I think, one of the absolutely most essential coaching skills. And like I said, sometimes I'm just, I don't know how a person can can be a coach and not know these essential skills. Now, I know from other interviews that I've done with people who are not specifically NLPers, but extremely good coaches, there's a lot of times they, they do this naturally. They do this naturally, or perhaps they do it through training in other coaching fields that do essentially the same thing, but that's not quite as as uh, systematized as NLP might be. But they still kind of get to the same thing. They ask good enough questions that they get good enough answers to be able to, you know, do very, very good work. And so they're kind of doing NLP without calling it NLP, if you will. To me, one of the really incredibly valuable things that I learned about NLP is that these structures are easy to learn. Now, they're not so easy that you'll learn them in one, you know, 45-minute podcast here, but you can learn them pretty easily by taking time to read a book, you know, like the User's Guide to Sleight of Mouth that I read, or Robert Diltz's book, Sleight of Mouth, things like that. You can, you can learn these things. You can. They're very eminently, eminent, eminently learnable. And when you do learn them, boy, oh gosh, you, 
<laughs> you will be glad you did. It's, it, it lights up your practice. Trust me on that. Um, so, yeah, sleight of mouth is a really great thing to do because once you've really discerned exactly what a person's belief is, then you can think to yourself, okay, now I know where they are in their logical mind. What What is that going to produce? If they believe this... What's that going to happen? What's going to happen as a result in their lives, in their relationships, in their business, because of their belief? If I can really discern exactly what it is that they're believing, I can pretty much predict exactly what kind of relationships they're going to be in, what their business is going to be like, you know, what their attitude towards health and vitality and optimism in life is going to be. You can pretty much outline it based on the structure of their beliefs, and then you can ask yourself. What do you want instead? You know, if you don't want what this is giving you, what do you want? What specifically do you want instead of that? And then we can create a blueprint for how to get from place A to place D or X or P, you, know, you name it. Where do you want to go? To find a way to get there, to find a belief system that supports you in getting there. And that's the really exciting thing about what sleight of mouth can do, is it can help you really create a structure for creating the reality you want to have in your life. <laughs> it's pretty magical, which is kind of, I think, where the word sleight of mouth comes from. Sleight of mouth comes from the idea that magic, you know, what we think of as, as magic of sleight of hand, is about, you know, misdirection. In other words, the reason a person can uh, be amazed when that rabbit pops out of the hat like that is because they weren't, they didn't notice how the rat got, rabbit got in there in the first place. Right? They were looking someplace else. They didn't see the rabbit enter the hat in the first place. So suddenly, when it pops out, it's like, oh, how did that get in there? Because they were misdirected. They were looking someplace else. Right? That's what sleight of mouth is all about. Robert Diltz described it like this. When he said he named it sleight of mouth after the, of course, magical thing of sleight of hand, he quoted Aristotle. He said, Aristotle once said that perception is 100%. So our unconscious mind takes in millions or billions of bits of information at any given moment. You know, the things that you see there might be millions of bits of visual data coming into your eyeballs. Um, auditorially, you might have millions of bits of sounds and things that some of which you're paying attention to, hopefully like my voice at the moment. But other sounds you might not be paying attention to, like the sound of the tennis ball or sounds of my breathing, the sounds of crickets chirping or things happening where you are, traffic or whatever. You know, might not be noticing those things. You're focusing on the voice or the ideas. There's billions of bits of information, but what you choose to focus on becomes your reality, doesn't it? What you focus on becomes your you know, perceived reality. So the perception is 100%, but the interpretation is different, right? So for instance, um, I'll sometimes do this test. In fact, you know, you can, you can do it right now. You can just test this for yourself. I have no idea where you are, what kind of places, things you're looking at as you, I don't know, maybe drive your car or sit in a room, listen to this. Maybe your eyes are closed, maybe you don't see anything at all. But if you were to open your eyes and look around and just ask yourself this question, what is metal around you right now? What's made out of metal in the room that you're in or the car that you're in? What can you see as you're driving that's made out of metal? And just notice that for a moment. Let's metal where you are. Sitting here in my living room, I'm seeing a, a music stand that's metal. I see a, a wood stove that's mostly metal. Um, I see handles on the doors. I see a lamp that's metal. I see this microphone that's metal. The computer that's largely metal. A um, pair of reading glasses that are metal. Lots, lots of metal things. But then if you were to close your eyes, don't do this if you're driving, of course. But if you were to close your eyes for a moment, and then uh, if I was to quiz you on your perception, say, okay, you were looking around, you saw those metal things. Now tell me with your eyes closed, 
what's red in the room that you're in? Now, without opening your eyes and cheating, you might notice that you didn't notice as much red stuff in the room that you're in or the whatever you can see from the place where you are as you saw metal things because you were looking for metal things. And why were you looking for metal things? Because I asked you to. I asked you, what's metal in here? What can you see where you are that's metal? And so you didn't notice anything else from that. I mean, you sort of did, but you didn't really focus on what's red or what's green or what's paper, what's cardboard. You didn't really notice what's black or white, right? So now if I asked you with your eyes closed to tell me everything you saw that's red, you'd probably pick up a portion, depending on where you are and how much red there is. You might pick up a portion of the redness that's there. But I'll tell you, even for me, even though I was asking the, one, asking the question, <laughs> now that I'm looking around for red, I'm seeing a lot more red than I did before I asked myself the question, asked us the question. You know, there's a red cushion over there. There's a red book with red writing on it. There's a little um, pouch on top of that book that's red. There's a red pen here. There's red drawings on the whiteboard behind me. There's a little angel with a red hat on. Um, you know, there's a lot of red. There's red on the computer screen. The little end button is red. You know, there's all kinds of red when I stop and think about it. And what's metal in here was far much more in my attention. So we create, in a way, our perception of reality, not the reality itself, but the perception of reality by the question that's foremost in our mind. And if you shift your question, you shift your reality. So sleight of mouth is saying that, yeah, it's not the perception that's the problem. It's the interpretation it's saying what's important to be looking at. You know, if I'm looking for all the metal things, I'm, I'm not seeing the red things. Not that they're not there, I'm just not seeing them because my perception is that that's not important, right? It's not important. So I focus on what I think is important, whether it's good things or bad things, scary things or happy things, you know, the meaning of an umbrella on Thursdays, you know. It's interpretation that's the issue. So perception versus interpretation. So the idea that Aristotle was saying that it's perception that's 100%, but it's the interpretation that's an issue is what sleight of mouth ultimately came from. Sleight of hand is saying, okay, uh, look over here, folks. I've got five fingers in this hand, and meanwhile I'm palming a card in the other hand. So you're, you could see them both if, if you were you know, perceiving 100%. But you're focusing on the hand that I'm telling you to focus on, saying this is what's important, and you're missing something else that's not important. Well, it is actually the most important thing, because later on I'll pull that card that I palmed in my right hand out and say, hey, look, it's the Ace of Clubs. Is that your card? You go like, whoa, how did that get in there? <laughs> you know, and you'll be amazed at the sleight of hand that took place. So sleight of mouth is like that. It's saying, how do you focus on particular strategies, particular parts of reality say that's important, but now let's shift that and make this other thing important. We're going to shift that focus. That's what sleight of mouth is all about. And you can get really amazing results for people just having conversations, just conversations. So the reason I'm telling you all of this is I think it's a vital importance. I really do. I really think that NLP, the meta model, sleight of mouth, changing beliefs conversationally is vitally important for any coach. I invite you to learn some of that. Some of the techniques are um, discernible uh, by reading books. You can get a lot of value out of book reading. There's also uh, tapes and, well, not tapes, I suppose, but recordings available. And over there in the Essential Coaching Skills um, website essentialskills.com there's you have access to that stuff by by joining us joining your little membership you can join the membership thing as it is and just the library itself has tons of stuff in there including pretty much everything i've ever published about sleight of mouth is in there for you you can just go there and 
you know, check it out into the library, if you will. You can download it. You can keep it forever for yourself. Plus, a whole bunch of other things. There's Ericksonian language patterns. There's whole classes on Ericksonian hypnosis. Tons of articles. Tons of sleight of mouth tips. Tons of things in that library. So, I'm, this isn't a commercial. I'm not telling you all this stuff for a reason, for um, you know, purposes of persuading you to join. But I just want you to know it is there. You can do this. You can probably also find stuff online and etc. that aren't, you know, mine. Um, that's probably true. You can do that. Other people, this is I didn't invent sleight of mouth. Robert Diltz did. Interestingly, I suppose. I don't know. Whenever I say interestingly, it's interesting to me. I learned sleight of mouth from Robert Diltz directly back in 1987, if I remember correctly. It might have been 88, but it was a long time ago. And I learned it from him and his partner at the time, Todd Epstein. And uh, they taught it in a particular way that it was really easy to learn with these charts. And then when his book finally came out somewhere in the 90s, I was shocked. I will tell you the honest truth. Shocked that he did not include those charts that I found so useful, so easy to understand Slater Mouth. He did not include those charts in his book. He made up those charts. He created those charts, but they weren't there. There's a lot of really fascinating theory and, you know, stuff. It's a good read, the book Slater Mouth, but the practicality of it was not there. That's what caused me to be motivated to write the book that I wrote, The User's Guide to Sleight of Mouth, um, because I wanted to put the charts in there. I find that, you know, to w actually do this stuff on the fly, in a conversation with your client, with your spouse, with your kids, you know, whatever it is, you want to have the skills you know, right there at your fingertips. I think those charts are vital in order to be able to do that. I think the way that Robert taught me was amazing. And so I wanted other people to have that too. So my book, The User's Guide to Sleight of Mouth, does that as best as I could in print. Um, it puts it out there for you to really learn how to do this for yourself, how you can master this techniques of sleight of mouth. You can, also, of course, get the recordings that are there too. Um, or or videos. Those are also available. There's so much available. But I, I really urge you to do it. And, and like I said, it doesn't have to be my stuff. You can get it from other places. But it is really important. And honestly, really, truly, honestly, I don't know how anybody can be a coach without knowing certain essential coaching skills like the meta model in neurolinguistic programming and sleight of mouth. Absolutely critical. So please <laughs> do take advantage of that. I know this is just an overview of this little whatever. I don't even know what time it is, uh, how long I've been talking right now, but there's lots to learn. The sleight of mouth uh, CD set that I did all those years ago is available on the uh, website for, you know, at the membership level and it's there. In the library, you can download it. It's two hours of material where I go through each and every pattern that's there and um, do it in such a way that I think you can really learn it. And it shows you the uh, the charts that makes it possible. And you can download the charts. So you can draw your own and you know how to do it. So it's possible to do that. And I invite you to, to, to make best advantage of these opportunities. So... That's it for today. I'm going to sign off here and get to sleep. It's late here at night. I don't know if you can tell from the sound of my voice, but it's, my, my voice might maybe sounded a little dark after a while. Nevertheless, thank you for listening, and uh, see you again next week. Well, that does it for another episode of the Essential Coaching Skills Podcast. Thanks so much for being here. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I certainly enjoyed having you here. Hey, if you want more information about Sleight of Mouth, you can find it at EssentialCoachingSkills.com, or you might even check out SleightofMouth.org. That's a nice website, too. Thanks. Stay safe. Stay curious. <laughs>